Hi everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer, and welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Um, I am not at my archive today. Uh, I am traveling, uh, mostly to celebrate my father's birthday today, uh, which is also why uh, we're not live today, because I'm hanging out with my dad. Uh, anyways, uh, got some special stuff planned for you today. Uh, when I travel, it, I, I tend to do thematic stuff uh, for some reason, which I don't do when I'm at the archive, I guess because I have more stuff to play with. Uh, so this first film is uh, fascinating. Um, this is part of, uh, really kind of leads to something more diabolical, but this is by, well, eventually it becomes Big Sugar. Um, this is a film uh, called Crystal of Energy, and it's about where sugar comes from and how great it is for us as humans and for our great economy. Um, it's, of course, uh, corrupted a bunch of nutrition, nutritional scientists who were convinced to not concentrate on sugar, but to concentrate on fat as being the, the great evil uh, for our diets. Um, and that was much later revealed, which was unfortunate. But anyways, uh, let's enjoy uh, The Crystal of Energy. Uh, this is by Robert Flaherty, uh, known for uh, The Nuke of the North. Enjoy. <laughs> as the sea, man's spirit drives him on, as it drove Columbus across an uncharted ocean to the discovery of a new world. In the centuries after Columbus, new civilizations arose in the lands he had found. Man's creative energy built cities to rival those of Europe. Of all the lands discovered by Columbus, none has had a more eventful history than the island where he established the first settlement in the New World. more vividly recalls the past. High in the mountains of this island, looking over valleys which once were battlegrounds, stands a fortress. More than a ago, the fortress represents the labor of thousands of men, carrying heavy burdens year after year up steep mountain trails. In the great citadel, relic of a vanished age, they left a monument to the energy of man. In this, our industrial age, man has harnessed other and speed his building. Power-driven tools need human energy to guide them. Human energy from good food and good health from good nutrition, a well-balanced diet. All foods are divided into three main classes, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. All three are sources of calories, supplying the body with heat or energy. So that the body may make full use of its food, vitamins and minerals though they furnish no calories, also are needed. A balanced diet will contain nutrients in about these proportions. Proteins, some 12%, carbohydrates, at least 50%. Fats and oils, the balance. Protein, a body-building and tissue-repairing material, is supplied by meat, eggs, milk products, and to some extent by vegetables like peas and beans. 
The amount of fat needed is not precisely known. Fat is a concentrated fuel, and some is required for palatability and to supply fat-soluble vitamins and essential fatty acids. Foremost among the foods and vital to good nutrition are the simple compounds of nature, and starches, which chemists call carbohydrates. None of these dietary elements can be entirely replaced by others. To receive full benefit from protein, we need an ample supply of carbohydrate, and we cannot get the full value of fat without carbohydrate. Obviously, the amount of food we need depends upon our activity. A grown man requires 3,000 calories a day. Vigorous exercise calls for more. Men engaged in heavy manual labor may need 5,000 calories. Much was learned about the importance of calories in treating victims of war starvation. Recovery was slow when their diets were deficient in energy foods, even though the diets contained all other elements needed for sound nutrition. Fortunately, nature has provided food in proportion to our needs. More than three-fourths of all plant material is carbohydrate. A pure carbohydrate, which all green plants build in their leaves through the action of the sun, is sucrose, or common sugar. In this crystal is stored the energy of the sun. A direct and inexpensive source of human energy, sugar has a valuable place in the diet. Familiar sugar is identical with the sugar that furnishes most of the nutritive value of our common fruits. Sugar can be extracted from any number of growing things, from date palms and a host of other plants. In all of nature, however, two plants are best adapted to convert and store the sun's energy, the sugar cane and the sugar beet. So they have become the traditional sources of man's supplies. Sugar cane thrives in warm, sunny climates with rich soils and abundant moisture. Its history goes back to antiquity. Alexander the Great, more than three centuries before Christ, brought cane from India to the shores of the Mediterranean. Christopher Columbus introduced it to the New World. Cane has been called the honey-bearing reed. Crude sugar mills were operating long before there were steam engines to drive them. The cane was fed by hand to vertical rollers. The juice was boiled until sugar solids formed. centuries, cane has been sold as a confection in the markets of the world. From the early 16th century, the sugar industry flourished in the lands Columbus found. Galleons sailed the Spanish main with treasures of sugar, and pirates sought it as eagerly as silver or gold. Cane brought from the West Indies was grown in Louisiana and Florida more than a quarter of a century before America became a nation. With the steam engine, came improvements in sugar machinery. Sugar cane is grown from sections of the stalk. Each joint in the stalk contains a bud, which sprouts when planted. 
In some areas, cane is planted by machines. The cane increases in sugar content as it matures. In 12 to 22 months, it is ready for harvest. The cane loves moisture. In areas where rainfall does not provide enough moisture, irrigation is practiced to yield abundant crops. Cane fills broad valleys, grows on mountainsides. Cane reaches to the ocean. Cane everywhere, endless fields of cane, ready for harvest. Cities and civilizations have grown up around the sugar cane, economic mainstay of whole countries. To handle the harvest are hundreds of great modern mills. tons or more of cane. A year, a year and a half or more, it has taken the cane to reach maturity. Now the harvest begins. cut at ground level, the top sliced off, and the leaves stripped from the stalk. With his sharp, heavy knife, a skilled workman can cut several tons of cane in a day. But the machine age is catching up with the cane cutter. Newly developed giants are appearing in many fields, some doing the work of 50 men. Sometimes the cane is set afire just before the cutting begins. The flames destroy the unwanted leaves, but the juice-filled stalks remain unharmed. Cane is grown in many lands and in widely varying circumstances. Local conditions determine the best methods of harvesting and transporting the crop from field to mill. The cane is a perennial plant, and like grass, new shoots spring from the roots. Several crops may be grown without replanting. Raw sugar mills perform the first industrial operation in the production of sugar. process begins with the grinding of the cane under great pressure.
When the cane is passed through a series of these heavy rollers, the crushed fibers are almost dry. The sugar-laden juice of the cane carries with it a number of other substances. By careful processing, these are separated from the sugar. The juice is boiled in immense vacuum pans until crystals form. High-speed centrifugal machines drive most of the molasses from the sugar, leaving only a thin coating on the crystals. This coating of molasses gives the raw sugar its light brown color. Raw sugar is 96% pure, often more. Packaged by machines, it is sent away for refining. The cane fiber which remains after the extraction of sugar is called bagasse. Some of it goes to fire the factory's boilers. Some of it is dried and baled and used to manufacture wallboard and insulating material. sugar is loaded in bulk into the holds of ships. Substantial quantities of sugar are refined in the areas of cane production. In most cases, however, the raw sugar of the tropics is shipped to our ports for refining. Ingenious unloading devices lessen the labor of handling raw sugar in bulk. Other lands, other methods. Most raw sugar is sent to us in sacks. Sugar is the largest dry cargo in our foreign trade. Here in the temperate zone, sugar is consumed in greatest volume. North America alone consumes 40 million pounds a day. Cane sugar comes to us from many areas, from Cuba, Puerto Rico, and other islands in the Caribbean, from Louisiana, Florida, and Hawaii, and from the Philippines. When raw sugar reaches the refinery, it is treated with syrup then begins a process of purification and crystallization not unlike the processes involved in getting sugar from another source. We'll leave the cane sugar refinery now to see about the other source. Snow-capped mountains, barren slopes, sun-baked plains, far cry indeed from the warm, moist lands which grow the cane. But in upland valleys, the beet thrives, as it does under a variety of growing conditions, from the Great Lakes to the Pacific. Scientists are constantly striving to develop better strains of beets and to improve planting techniques. Precision drills drop seeds at regular intervals in the row. This method of planting reduces the later job of thinning give each beet space for proper growth. Once done entirely by hand, thinning by machines is rapidly increasing. Where rainfall is scant, man has harnessed mountain streams, built dams to control the waters dug canals to channel them, and thrown great pipelines across miles and miles of desert lands. So, 
all water is brought to the farmer's fields. Irrigation and sugar beet production have been the means of reclaiming vast areas of the West, transforming arid wastes into fertile farms and productive communities. Water is life to the beet. Adapted to agriculture in the temperate zone, the beet matures in six or seven months. By harvest time, three-fourths of the beet's weight is moisture. The average beet weighs about two pounds. The harvest begins when the beet lifter is driven through the fields. It breaks off the long tap roots of the beets and loosens the soil around them. Now the leafy tops are removed from the sugar-bearing roots. More and more machines are taking over the topping of beets. Not so long ago, an exclusively hand labor operation. The leafy beet tops are fed to livestock. remains after the sugar has been extracted from the beet. Thus, these byproducts of the beet are converted into meat and milk. Manure goes back to the beet fields. Nutrients return to the soil. Mechanical harvesters appear in the beet fields in steadily increasing numbers. Some are equipped with loaders, which convey the beets directly to trucks. One of these machines, in a continuous operation, uproots the beets, removes the tops and loads them. grow. These loaders take five tons at every bite. taken to the factory, which may be some distance away. A good harvest indeed. Beets everywhere. Beets piled to the factory's door. At the factory, the beets are unloaded into flumes of swiftly moving water. As they enter the factory, the beets are washed carefully to remove the last bits of soil that may cling to them. The washed beets 
are carried to weighing scales and then to slicers. From the slicing machines, the beets emerge as thin strips. These are emptied into large diffusion tanks where the sugar is soaked from them by hot water. The juice is treated to remove some of the non-sugars it contains and filtered several times. In great evaporator tanks, the juice is boiled to a heavy syrup. From here on, generally speaking, the processing of beet sugar parallels that of cane sugar. Now the syrup is boiled in vacuum pans until it is full of sugar crystals. Close laboratory control is kept over every step of the processing of beet and cane sugar. The centrifugal is common to beet sugar factories and cane refineries. Here, the crystals are whirled against a screen which filters out the syrup and leaves the pure white sugar. Molasses is sugar's most important byproduct. After various treatments, it will find innumerable uses in food, in industry, in medicine. Sugar refining has a single purpose, to extract pure sugar, just as it was made by nature in plants. Grown under widely different conditions, the cane and the beet yield an identical sugar. The sugar of commerce, sucrose. Screened and dried, sugar is packaged in a variety of ways, in 100 pound cotton sacks, in paper bags of various sizes. Filling and sealing are done by machines. Lump sugar, specially treated and sometimes individually wrapped, goes into small cartons. Cartons too for brown sugar, for granulated and for powdered sugar. Not only is sugar an important energy food in its own right, it is an important ingredient in hundreds of other foods. To keep them harvest fresh through all the seasons, sugar is used in canning nearly all fruits. Rich in sugar too are most packaged breakfast foods. Meats, especially hams and bacons, are cured and flavored with sugar. But sugar is more than a sweetener of other foods. In baking, sugar acts as a food for yeast. Yeast converts part of the sugar in bread dough to carbon dioxide gas. The gas raises the dough and gives the bread its familiar texture and contributes to the golden brown color of the crust. Sugar used in baking cakes improves the texture and prevents drying out. blends flavors and lends taste appeal to the many nutrients of candy. Sugar not only sweetens carbonated beverages, but gives them body. Sugar lends the desired sweetness to ice cream and contributes to its texture. Chemistry and medical science have brought sugar or its derivatives to the drugstore. It's there in some form in any number of things. To name just a few, cough syrups, sugar-coated pills, penicillin, citrate of magnesia, vitamins, cosmetics, toothpaste, anesthetics, antiseptics, and surgical dressings. The main source of the citric acid used in blood plasma is beet sugar molasses. Never content, science has lured sugar or its derivatives into the composition of such unexpected things as plastics, synthetic rubber, paints and varnishes, pencil leads, glue and gum paper, flashlight batteries and camera films, in the manufacture of explosives, 
sugar plays an important part. No less important are its uses in industry. There's sugar in the composition of welding rods, sugar products in some of the molds used in shaping metals essential to modern building. Thus a source of man's energy helps to build his industries. Day by day, more is being learned of sugar's role in human nutrition, in chemistry, in medicine. Untiring is the quest of new and greater usefulness to mankind for this versatile product, made by nature in the cane and the beet. Giver of energy from the sun, this magic crystal, sugar. love you know it's it, it, like i said it's diabolical but i love films like this that are just this is how great sugar is for us and and all that um so uh on fridays we generally i try to show stuff uh or what has happened is that people love to watch old tv ads and uh so i have quite a few and this next batch is um very specific and this isn't part of our collection, but this is something we digitized uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, well, maybe not now, maybe 13 years ago for Duke University's Ad Views project. And this is uh, a bunch of Beechwood gum commercials. So lots and lots of awesome chewing gum commercials. Enjoy. Five times the bite, five times the flavor of any other mint gum. Complacent, refreshment, assortment, enjoyment. Go, 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 go. New beach nuts. Five mint gum. Yikes and Spikes, Beech Nuts Gum. By Beech Nuts, by Gum. Yikes and Spikes, and Fruit Spikes Gum. By Beech Nuts, by Gum. By Gum. No, by Gum. By Beech Nuts, by Gum. By Beech Nuts, by Gum. By Fruit Spikes Gum. By Gum. Yikes and Spikes. By Beech Nuts, by Gum. By Golly. By Gum. With five different flavors. With extra flavor for the whole family and every stripe. Luscious Lime Stripe. Lip Smack and Lemon Stripe. Delicious Orange Stripe. Mixed Fruit and Cherry Stripe. All for you in every pack of beech nut fruit stripe gum by beech nut by gum by tea by gum by ting by gush and there's extra flavor for the whole family in every scrumptious stripe. More flavors to choose, more flavors to choose. The flavor starts lively, the flavor stays lively by beech nut by beech nut by gum by gum. Beech nut fruit stripe for the whole family by gum. This calls for the sour stripe. Help! 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 A quick change and beech nut stripes again. New beech nut sour stripes gum. Five fruit flavors in every pack. Ugh. New sour stripes gum hangs on to flavor. How does that stripe you? Sour! Who was that stripe man anyway? I don't know, but he left this. Buy beech nut! Buy gum! Get hung up. Look for the beech nut when you buy gum. Beech nut gum has got a lot, and that flavor that it's got, yeah, that rush of gushing flavor hangs on, hangs on, hangs on to what it's got. Oh. Hang on to flavor. Buy beech nut. Buy gum.
Beech nut has a new gum. Beech nut fancy fruit. Fancy that. Beech nut has a new gum. Beech nut fancy fruit. Fancy that. Beech nut has a new gum. Beech nut fancy fruit. Fancy that. Fancy fruit hangs on to flavor. What flavor? Fancy flavor. Fancy what? Fancy fruit by beech nut. What nut? By, by beech nut. nut. By gum. Beechnut fruit stripe is the most deliciousest gum on earth. Maybe even in the world. Right. In the world, fruit stripe's got the five tastiest flavors in the universe. Right. Stripe, stripe, they're better than buy it. Right. And you know what? Fruit stripe is Super A1 stupendoramic. Right. And I'd like to further remark, it's rapturously sensationalistic. Right. Oh, I think it's lots better than buy it. Right. Fruit stripe flavor really hangs on. Mm, hangs on? Hangs on. It's the greatest by gum. Right. Uh, except for beech nut candy stripe. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. And beech nut cherry stripe. And frosty stripe. And grape stripe. Yikes, stripes. By beech nut by gum. Right. We're looking for good flavor in sugarless gum. We're looking for a new kind of sugarless gum that's carefree. Sugarless gum that really tastes good. New Carefree from Beech Nut. Yeah, I, I gotta go get some fruit stripe gum. <laughs> it's a problem with uh, when we did a bunch of these commercials. So we, we, we did, this is part of a collection uh, that was made by advertisers, Benton and Bowles. And so there was a bunch of um, general food cereals, post cereals. Uh, there was a bunch of Crest commercials, a bunch of Pampers commercials. Uh, and, you know, we would watch hours and hours and hours, you know, hundreds of commercials a day uh, digitizing this collection. And this was more than 10,000 TV commercials. And it would just turn our brains to mush. Um, but I got to see the entire history of Crest and the entire history of Sugar Bear and the entire history of Mr. Whipple, the uh, Charmin salesman. Uh, grocer. Uh, something that I hope to do as a special thing with the Fountain Footage Festival guys. Um, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed these. I'm sure there were some duplicates in there, but um, appreciate you guys tuning in. We'll be back live uh, on Monday. Everybody have a great weekend. If you like what you saw, you can support us by buying us sugar uh, or actually coffee um, by ko-fi.com slash abgeeks. You can also hit the thumbs up button, the like, the subscribe. All those are great ways to say thank you. Everybody have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll talk to you soon.